During the last 24 hours, a few notable events occurred in Ukraine, which I would now like to discuss. The first and perhaps most notable of these is the mass surrender of 1,026 Ukrainian Marines from the Ukrainian 36th Marine Brigade, which for all intents and purposes has now ceased to exist. And this is, as of right now, by far the largest mass surrender of the armed forces of Ukraine, as well as a clear indication that the garrison of Mariupol is living out its last days. I will remind everybody that the first mass surrender in Mariupol took place on April 4th, when 267 Ukrainian Marines surrendered. After this, once every few days, we got more news about a platoon surrendering here and a concentration of forces surrendering there. After this, on April 11th, there was an attempt by the Ukrainian forces to break through the encirclement and to flee Mariupol, which was largely unsuccessful and resulted in more than 100 fighters being captured, some being eliminated, and only a handful managing to escape the Russian forces. And from what I understand, those handful of Ukrainian soldiers, if they haven't been already found, are being actively searched for. And then on April 12th, we got this enormous news that over 1,000 soldiers of the Mariupol garrison are surrendering. And this is the equivalent of a full-strength battalion. Of course, the garrison at Mariupol is nowhere near at full strength, so this is more like the remnants of an entire brigade. According to the surrendered soldiers, they have very little food left, they have very little ammunition, and for this reason, they are surrendering. So we have this tendency, this very clear tendency, of more and more Ukrainian soldiers in Mariupol surrendering almost every day. And this, of course, is as clear a sign as any, that the garrison in Mariupol is collapsing, it is living out its last days. I do not predict that we will see any other surrender in Mariupol of this scale, simply because there aren't that many Ukrainian soldiers left in Mariupol. There are likely only about 1,000 soldiers that are holed up in the Azovstal steel mill. And by the way, it's been quite amazing to see how the Ukrainian government tried to spin this. After declaring the Mariupol garrison the heroes of Ukraine, of course, heroes don't surrender, the Zelensky government has to somehow spin this in a positive light. And this is the positive spin. Before today, the garrison at Mariupol, what remains of the Ukrainian garrison in Mariupol, was surrounded in two separate pockets. Of the 1,000 surrendered soldiers, some surrendered willingly, but some surrendered after a battle, after a failed attempt to break through one of these encirclements and reach the other encirclement. And from what we're hearing, a very small portion of these forces succeeded in breaking through. We're talking about maybe 50 to 100 soldiers succeeding in breaking through one encirclement and reaching the other encirclement as all forces within the first encirclement were eliminated. And the Ukrainian media is focusing on this fact of maybe a few dozen fighters from the 36th Marine Brigade reaching the Azov Battalion at Azovstal and fortifying their positions. Never mind the fact that over 1,000 of these soldiers surrendered. Never mind the fact that there is virtually no food, water, or ammunition left. The fact that a tiny fraction of these soldiers managed to break through an encirclement and walk a few kilometers to a nearby steel mill is apparently a great triumph. And I am not exaggerating this. Ukrainian propaganda is saying that because of this, the garrison in Mariupol is getting a second chance to basically win the whole battle. And all I can say about this is that this is no less deluded than Goebbels' propaganda in 1945, which was talking about Germany winning the war while the Red Army was taking Berlin. Anyways, enough about that, let us now move north and discuss the situation at the main contact line in the Donbass. Today's morning briefing of the Russian Ministry of Defense revealed something very important and interesting. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense, Russian conventional artillery and rocket artillery struck 693 Ukrainian targets, and it is without a doubt that the majority of these were in the Donbass. 
After all, this is where the vast majority of the forces on both sides are concentrated. Of these 693 barrages, it is reported that 676 targeted Ukrainian troops and vehicle concentrations. That is to say, troops at the front line were primarily targeted, overwhelmingly targeted, as opposed to any strategic targets like ammunition depots, communication centers, command posts, bridges, etc. And of course, 693 targets destroyed by artillery is much more than the 40 to 80 airstrikes that we were hearing every day up until now. So my conclusion based off of all of this is that this seems to be the artillery bombardment that precedes a major offensive. After all, the classical thing to do before a major offensive is to bombard enemy positions from artillery, either for a single day or for a few days, before starting your offensive. However, my personal prediction is that in the era of satellite surveillance and drone surveillance, artillery is much more precise and powerful, and the Russians may choose to sustain this bombardment for several days, after which there will almost certainly be a massive ground offensive. And the last thing that I wanted to cover today was a bit of news that I haven't heard being reported in Western media, but which I have heard lots about from Russian media. And this is the news that Poland decided to send stocks of its old Soviet equipment, including 100 T-72M tanks, as military aid to Ukraine. And it is reported that the first batch of this military aid has already arrived somewhere in Ukraine, presumably somewhere in western or northern Ukraine, that is to say, far away from the contact line, at least for now. But the reason that I found this interesting is that the T-72M is a very old modification of the T-72 main battle tank. Of course, both Russia and Ukraine are using T-72 tanks in Ukraine. Ukraine is also using T-64 tanks. But by and large, these are very thoroughly modernized vehicles. And I would even say that by modern standards, they are fairly capable. The T-72M, on the other hand, is a very old modification of the T-72 tank. These are the tanks which were famously annihilated by the American army, by American M1A1 Abrams tanks during the 1991 Gulf War. And that Gulf War took place more than 30 years ago. So this equipment was pretty much outdated 30 years ago. And yet today, Ukraine is receiving it as military support in the year 2022. Needless to say, these tanks are going to make an absolutely minimal difference to the situation on the ground. That is, if Ukraine can even find crewmen who are trained enough to use these tanks, the only situation in which they could possibly be useful for and inflict some kind of casualties on Russian forces is if they catch said Russian forces out of position, that is to say, something like an ambush. In any other scenario, they are just going to be targets for Russian artillery and for the Russian Air Force. And that is, of course, if Ukraine can even find the fuel necessary to operate them. Though I imagine that Western countries, including Poland, might supply some of that. So, these are some of the topics that I wanted to discuss for today. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to leave a like. It always helps the algorithm, especially on YouTube. And also, please be sure to check out my Telegram channel as well as if you're watching this on YouTube, please check out my Rumble channel. If you're watching this on Rumble, check out my YouTube channel. All of the links will be in the video description. And with that said, I wish you all a wonderful day.